All right. Um, yeah, so thanks for, uh, uh, you know, Maria, uh, uh, for organizing this. Uh, Darian Rice, uh, I'm clearly not Darian Rice. Uh, if you were expecting to see her keep a presentation, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but uh, uh, she had a, a personal issue, which is why she couldn't present. And so I decided to, uh, um, uh, instead of canceling, uh, give the talk. Um, I'll be, uh, I changed the title a little bit. I'm going to give you a little bit broader overview of uh, pulse infrared stimulation um, and the applications that we have uh, been using in the inner ear. Um, and I'll introduce a lot of her data uh, talking about uh, vestibular sympathetic reflex and, and the pathway that we're learning um, <clears throat> from this study. Uh, Federica is another uh, doctoral student in my lab, and then uh, John uh, is a faculty in physiology and biophysics who's been a collaborator on this project. Um, uh, if you have any questions during the uh, presentation, please feel free to put it in the chat, um, and I'll, be, uh, I'll try to answer it uh, right then. Um, otherwise, I'll answer all the questions uh, at the end. So, <clears throat> Before I start talking about uh, pulse infrared radiation and, and why we use it, I uh, just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, the inner ear, the auditory and the vestibular system. Um, so the uh, auditory and the vestibular structures are uh, phylogenetic phylogenetically uh, some of the oldest uh, systems. Um, if you look at fossil fuel records from uh, 400 million years ago, you can see a very clearly outlined uh, anatomy of uh, uh, the canals, the semicircular canals, which are used for detection of balance. Um, on the right, uh, you actually see how that system has evolved. Uh, and this is actually a human inner ear, showing you the cochlea and the vestibular system. Um, and I like this picture to show uh, sort of like the scale um, and the size of the system. Um, in your anatomy books, uh, I think like you know, most of you have seen uh, something like this, which shows you uh, the cochlea, the spiral, which is your auditory organ, the one that allows us to uh, have a, a very fine-tuned hearing. And then to the sister uh, system is the, uh, to the side is the uh, vestibular system, which comprises of three semicircular canals, the ones that, main, that, that detect angular head rotations. Uh, so when you are uh, saying yes or no, for example, or tilting your head sideways. Uh, and then uh, there are two other uh, organs known as olith organs, uh, the utricle and the saccule, that allow us to detect linear accelerations and gravity. Um, and then all of this information goes via uh, essentially the eighth cranial nerve uh, through the, the, either the vestibular nucleus for the vestibular information or the dorsal cochlear nucleus and inferior colliculus to the auditory cortex. Uh, the auditory system, again, I think like you know, many of you will be familiar from your uh, neuroscience class um, or a physiology class that you might have taken, uh, has uh, a row of inner ear hair cells, uh, the ones that actually uh, are responsible for uh, sending the sound signals up to the auditory cortex. And then three rows of outer hair cells, uh, so the ones that are shown over here, that are essentially uh, a mechanical amplifier. So they amplify the sound. So as we age, those are the, organ that, those are the hair cells that we lose first. Um, as long as we have inner ear hair cells, inner hair cells, uh, we can still uh, detect sounds. Uh, we can still trans transduce the sound. Um, what you lose when you lose outer, outer hair cells is the uh, ability to amplify, so about 35 to 40 decibels. Um, and in most cases, hearing aids will suffice. Uh, but when uh, there is a loss of inner ear hair cells, um, that's when you, you start to need a cochlear implant because you need to stimulate the nerve directly. Um, this is a human vestibular uh, system uh, uh, anatomy, uh, sort of showing you the three semicircular canals. So you have the posterior canal, the anterior canal, and the, and the horizontal canal, uh, essentially acting to detect uh, linear uh, angular acceleration such as no. So this is your lateral plane uh, detected, detected by your lateral or horizontal semicircular canal. Uh, pitch such as yes and no uh, detected, uh, detected by your anterior semicircular canals and tilt detected by the posteriors. Uh, again, because of biomechanical constraints, uh, the semicircular canals cannot detect linear accelerations or, or uh, accelerations because of gravity. Um, and so we have uh, two other otolith organs known as utricle and the saccule, uh, 
uh, that tend to detect uh, linear accelerations essentially in a, in a 360 degree plane. Um, now, switching a little bit towards optical stimulation, so many of you might have heard of these different terms um, or might, not, might know a lot about it. Um, so when we think about optical stimulation, traditionally, uh, there's been a lot of work in low-level light therapy, uh, sort of through the simulation of uh, mitochondria, absorption of wavelengths in the cytochrome C oxidase uh, to, to, to have an effect. Um, uh, there's also been a lot of research on caged molecules and photo, uh, photo release. Uh, so people might know these papers uh, from 2005, 2007, where uh, uh, scientists were using caged molecules um, uh, in, uh, in, in cultures, in neurons, um, and then use light uh, to essentially release uh, the caged molecules, for example. And of course, from uh, Ed Boyden and Carl Dyselrod's work, everybody uh, is probably familiar with optogenetics, a uh, way in which we can actually transfect cells and make them photosensitive. You can use, uh, for example, blue and green light uh, to either depolarize or hyperpolarize the cells, depending upon the type of uh, channel that you're, uh, that you're looking at uh, in these particular cells. And, and of course, optogenetics has gained a lot of a lot of attraction in the neuroscience community, uh, given its potential for research and, and potentially even therapeutics. Now, um, I'm going to go a little bit different from, from these methods uh, and talk about a direct way to stimulate neurons. So, so these are experiments from 1960s, uh, where Arvanitaki and Chilozenitis, uh, what they showed in aplesia neurons, that when you shine infrared laser on, on a neuron, you can produce a, a change in the firing pattern of these aplesia neurons. Um, and you can, you can get this, you know, sort of really excitatory response that's sort of shown in the bottom, uh, depending upon the intensity, you can produce an excitatory response at a very high firing rate. Or in some cases, you would end up actually silencing the neuron. So you can see on the top, there are two different neurons. One of them gets excited and one of them gets inhibited. Uh, so, so we've known for a while that there are, uh, there are um, uh, endogenous mechanisms uh, in neurons uh, and even other excitable cells like cardiomyocytes, for example, uh, where we can shine infrared lasers um, and, and produce a, a, a change, uh, whether that's uh, an intracellular change in terms of calcium response uh, or uh, whether that's something that actually results in synaptic release and hence a postsynaptic response. Uh, or a silencing effect, uh, such as the one that's shown here. Um, the idea for optical stimulation and why it's attractive uh, in the field of neuroscience um, is, is pretty clear, right? So, so we know that uh, electrical stimulation produces a significant artifact, um, which makes uh, a sort of spatial selectivity uh, of electrical stimulation challenging. Uh, so you can't have two electrodes that are fairly close to each other and be able to produce, uh, uh, you know, uh, spatially selective stimulation in neurons. Um, we also know, uh, so, for, so that was a spatial, uh, spatially precise, we also know that the, the electrodes uh, have to be in close contact with the neural tissue, um, uh, whereas if you had uh, optical stimulation or a way in which you could deliver photons through, through an optical source, such as an optical fiber, for example, placed uh, several hundred microns away from, from the neuron, um, that might be beneficial. And of course, uh, you're using either a chemical or photochemical or a photothermal or a photomechanical energy to produce a response uh, rather than depositing charge. So, so you avoid uh, uh, sort of issues with the electrochemical uh, artifacts. Um, in uh, around uh, 2006, seven, while uh, you know Dasselroth and, and others were working on uh, sort of coming up with the, with the technique of optogenetics, um, a group at Vanderbilt University was actually uh, looking at whether uh, long wavelength infrared, so 1800 nanometers, 2100 nanometers, can be used in a rat sciatic nerve uh, to produce uh, stimulation um, and see a response, and so. Um, uh, here was a, a, a resident actually uh, uh, asked to uh, use infrared radiation to ablate the sciatic nerve. So he was actually trying to damage the nerve. Um, uh, and what he found is that whenever he switched the laser to around 2100 nanometers, just like an electrical stimulation 
produce action potential, a compound response in the nerve, he would get an optical response as well. Uh, and then he would see a muscle switch. Um, and so they realized that there might be something going on over here that's more than just you know, potential for an ablation, but rather maybe a mechanism for stimulation. Um, they showed um, at the time uh, in the rat sciatic nerve that if you compare electrical stimulation versus uh, this fiber coupled laser at 2100 nanometers, that you can actually stimulate specific fiber bundles within the nerve. So for example, what they're showing you here on the top is uh, using a, a monopolar electrical stimulation, which ends up stimulating an entire nerve, <clears throat> and you generate compound potentials both in the gastrocnemius as well as in the, in the femoris fascicles. Um, and then uh, below, or below what they're showing you uh, in the panel B uh, is the optical stimulation uh, because of uh, the uh, absorption uh, distance uh, for, uh, for, the, for this particular wavelength being around 700 nanometers. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 700 nanometers or so, you'll get a very uh, a sort of superficial stimulation from this and you end up only getting a compound uh, response from, uh, from one, of the, one of the fiber bundles. <clears throat> Uh, at the time, they were working with technology that looked like this. Uh, so, so this is a, um, an FEL room that was built at a cost of about $25 million in Vanderbilt, um, where they had been using different lines, so different wavelengths of lasers uh, to, to look at different ablation properties and different tissue optical properties. Uh, since then, technology has come a long way, right? So um, the laser technology keeps getting better. We've had like, you know, benchtop lasers down to, these lasers that right now for research purposes we use in our lab called Capella, uh, which are the size of essentially a DVR player. Um, and then uh, when I was doing my postdoc at Northwestern, uh, uh, we had switched to a cell phone sized uh, a laser. This is a three channel system that we used to implant in the cats uh, and stimulate the auditory system with that. To now, uh, what we are moving towards is using uh, micron sized uh, vexels, vertical cavity surface emitting laser. So this is, for example, on the right side is shown one of these uh, vexel diodes. Uh, and each of these is potentially a laser source that can be stimulated, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, uh, micro LEDs uh, that are fairly small that can be driven in, in uh, long wavelength infrared uh, with sufficiently high power. Um, so, so the technology is catching up, which means that uh, we can actually, instead of just doing this in, in an ex vivo type of a preparation, we can start to move towards in vivo, and that's where we've been going. Um, uh, also thinking about like, you know, potentially how this might be implanted in patients. So uh, in, in our lab, as I said, we use uh, this Capella laser. Uh, it's uh, a laser source that is uh, primarily act using a 1860 nanometer wavelength. So long infrared wavelength. Um, uh, we use uh, different pulse frequencies uh, to stimulate the neurons. Um, and we use different pulse durations so we can change the properties of the pulse itself um, and, and, and study that as well as the pulse shape. So right now we use square pulses, but we have ability to change this into uh, uh, triangular pulses, for example, as well as others. Uh, we've recorded you know, uh, responses in guinea pigs, cats, and, and I'll show you some data from the rats uh, today. Uh, we've done that in, uh, uh, during my postdoc, what I was working was, uh, is to take the data from the Vanderbilt and study this in, in the cochlea uh, and see if we can stimulate the auditory neurons in the cochlea. Uh, and we used to do uh, both inferior colliculus recordings as well as uh, behavioral responses in cats. And I'll show you some of that uh, very briefly uh, over here. So, so on the left, what you see over here is uh, acoustically evoked response in, in the auditory nerve. So the compound action potential from the eighth nerve recorded uh, when we provided auditory tones. And you can see this really nice auditory tone. We deafened these guinea pigs. Um, and a couple of hours after deafening these guinea pigs, uh, we put a laser fiber, uh, very similar to a cochlear implant. Um, and what we could do is we could evoke a compound action potential, um, at least at some of the higher laser powers uh, in the nerve. Uh, so this was our sort of proof of concept that, that this infrared wavelength can be used to stimulate uh, neurons in, in, the, in the guinea pigs, uh, in the guinea pig cochlea. Uh, how about spatial selectivity? So as I said, like, you know, one of the promises of uh, optical stimulation, whether that be optogenetics or, some, or, or infrared stimulation, uh, is spatial selectivity. So how spatially selective is uh, infrared radiation, for example? And that's always a question that we get asked. Um, 
So what we did was uh, we put electrodes in the inferior collicula. So, so as you guys might remember, inferior collicula is sort of like a peel of, it's like an onion or uh, where different layers of the onion represented different frequencies. So the tonotopic map that's present in the cochlea actually is preserved uh, in the inferior collicula. So you can put a multi-channel electrode along the length uh, of this inferior colliculus um, and, and you can measure response it at different frequency, frequency placements in the cochlea. And by putting fiber, optical fibers in different locations, what we could do is we could record um, these spatial maps. Uh, and what we could see is that the responses, uh, especially at some of these frequencies, are very, very narrow. Uh, and you can see over here at five different frequency placements uh, within the cochlea with the optical fibers, we could evoke a fairly spatially selective response. On the right side for comparison, I'm showing you a similar response that you would get if you had a multi, uh, if you had a monopolar electrical stimulation. And what you see is that across the entire frequency map, which is your, which is your X axis, you end up getting a very broad stimulation. And only at some of these, uh, some of these points, uh, you, you get like, you know, a, a, a some amount of selectivity uh, uh, at uh, uh, some of the very lower currents, current levels, right? Um, and we've done like, you know, published uh, a lot of literature on this, comparing this to electrical versus acoustic stimulation. And it turns out that uh, infrared radiation uh, in the cochlea is uh, very close to acoustic stimulation. So a, a, an acoustic stimulation uh, that, that would produce a similar amount of spread uh, in the inferior colliculus. Uh, Prior to uh, me moving to uh, uh, Miami uh, and starting my own lab, we uh, implanted some uh, cats uh, with uh, infrared lasers. Uh, so this is a cat that was implanted on in the left ear. Um, and what, what you see over here on the top is a behavioral response where we turned on the device or where the laser started to deliver pulses of stimulation uh, to, the, uh, to the cochlea. Um, of the of the of the cat and the cat heard uh, most likely a continuous tone because it was a continuous infrared stimulation a pulse infrared stimulation at several hundred hertz uh, so it probably heard something like eh. um, and and you can see that it it got annoyed at the beginning and started to look for the look for that tone where is that tone coming from uh, and because it was implanted on the left side it predominantly kept turning towards the left side trying to identify the source of that sound. Um, and here on the bottom, we show you a behavioral response from four different cats uh, in different colors uh, that are shown where as the laser is turned on, um, in the first uh, 60, uh, first minute or a couple of minutes, uh, they'll continue to look for that source. Of course, any of you who own cats know that they are, they kind of lose interest very quickly on anything that's new. Um, so after some time, they would lose the interest. And on the bottom is just a control condition uh, where there was no laser. Uh, so that's the right side uh, movement, for example, right? Uh, so this was our sort of proof of concept that uh, not only could we evoke a neural response, not only was that spatially selective, similar to an acoustic response, uh, but that it can actually produce uh, a behavioral uh, response in the cats as well. Uh, and since then, uh, Klaus Peter Richter at Northwestern has been um, uh, sort of taking this idea and, and, and testing it in uh, deaf cats, uh, and he's shown that responses can be evoked in this. Uh, we're, we're working together, actually. Uh, Miami uh, is going to be one of the sites, um, uh, if we get uh, our R01 funded this round, uh, to develop multi-channel uh, optical electrical uh, implants for cochlear stimulation. These are human uh, electrodes. So this is, for example, one of the electrodes that um, uh, we have been produced at North. We have been able to produce at Northwestern University using multiple channels of these infrared lasers, these LEDs that have been put in. Um, and this is a, a 3D mold of a cochlea um, that we used uh, a human uh, micro CT data to sort of reconstruct uh, so, that, so that the diameters of the, of the cavities, the scale of tympani is appropriate. And we could actually put in, an, put in our optical fiber and show that we can spatially stimulate at multiple different locations with this. Uh, so, so my so University of Miami, Northwestern University, um, uh, and Mississippi State are going to be the ones that are going to participate in uh, potentially a human trial, uh, where in the OR, uh, prior to getting a, a traditional cochlear implant, we'll go in, we'll test out our optical stimulation, uh, record, uh, uh, evoke responses uh, from the auditory nerve. Now. Um, 
what does that have to do with uh, uh, stuff that's done in my lab and Darian's project? So I'm going to switch a little bit now towards the vestibular system rather than talk about the auditory system. Um, so, so we know that just like the auditory uh, uh, neurons, the vestibular neuroepithelium is also highly sensitive to this long wavelength infrared. We did some experiments early on uh, in, uh, in a toadfish preparation uh, where we stimulated uh, the semicircular canal, the neuroepithelium, as you can see over here on the left, uh, as well as on the inset. And we recorded from, from the nerve and what we found, very similar to uh, the responses that uh, Chalosinitis uh, and Arvani Taki showed in, in, in that 1960s paper, that we could produce in that postsynaptic nerve, uh, we could uh, postsynaptic neurons, we could produce either a, a very ex highly excitatory response. So this is a baseline firing rate of the neuron around like you know, 50 hertz, 50 spikes per second. And during optical stimulation with infrared, it ends up close to being around 120 spikes per second. And when we turn it off, uh, it will level back onto its resting discharge. Whereas this other neuron goes, goes inhibitory and we can actually completely silence it um, uh, at some point. Um, we can actually phase lock uh, many of these neurons, uh, which uh, gave us some promise uh, in terms of sort of understanding some of the mechanisms. Um, and I'm not going to go into the mechanisms today. Uh, Federica Rucciri in my lab has been uh, working on this project. And, and, and at some point, maybe she can give a presentation on the mechanisms. Uh, but we've been looking at what the mechanisms of this infrared stimulation are, uh, as well as how we can potentially use this in vivo um, uh, and, and, in think, and in future think about potentially a, a vestibular prosthesis. Um, uh, other groups have actually, uh, after our studies, uh, shown that um, uh, in other uh, animals, so such as chinchilla, for example, you get a very similar response. You get, uh, these are again, like, you know, uh, eighth nerve responses uh, from the vestibular part of the nerve. Uh, where you see an excitatory, sort of a mixed inhibitory, excitatory response, as well as this inhibitory and silencing response over here. Uh, so we know that this is not just something that's specific to, for example, toadfish um, or aplesia, uh, but rather that this is uh, uh, sort of a, a, a general uh, a, a phenomenon, general mechanism that works in uh, other neurons as well and other systems as well. Um, in my lab, uh, we use uh, a couple of different measures. So in addition to using the eighth nerve um, as, a, as a measure, we also use uh, eye movements uh, that are recorded through the vestibulo-ocular reflex. Uh, so many of you will know that there is a three-neuron three uh, arc uh, from the vestibular system through the vestibular nucleus um, uh, up, through the, uh, up to the, uh, uh, up to the uh, uh, eye muscles uh, that, that control your eye movement in the opposite direction of your head movement. So this allows like, you know, image of the retina to be stable, uh, image of the world to be stable on your retina. Um, and what we do with the infrared stimulation is we provide a modulated stimulation. So just like moving your head left and right sinusoidally, uh, if we put in an optical stimulator, uh, a fiber, uh, to stimulate a specific end organ in the vestibular system in a rat, uh, we can evoke essentially a similar response in the nerve and hence get an eye movement that is also sinusoidal. So you can see over here in the bottom uh, are the graphs uh, for left and the right eye. And then on the top, you can see ipsilateral and contralateral lateral eye uh, doing a very uh, characteristic uh, sinusoidal stimulation. The contralateral goes up and down, whereas the ipsilateral has this sort of like, you know, rotation torsional movement um, that we can measure by placing uh, fiducial markers, for example, on the eye, as well as by looking at the pupil and the corneal reflections. Um, so we use uh, eye movements as, as one of the physiological markers uh, to tell us about, uh, about how the inferred stimulation is working. Um, and, and, and today's topic, as you remember, had something to do with uh, uh, you know, postural control um, of, of uh, cardiovascular response. Um, and, and this is, you know, as I'll come towards the end in the talk, I'll talk a little bit about how this might be relevant for spinal cord injury. Um, so, so what is the connection between vestibular system and postural blood control, for example? So we know that sympathetic activation is important for postural blood pressure regulation. There are mechanisms that are already uh, very well characterized in, in sorts of understanding, like you know, how uh, as we, for example, uh, get up from the bed or a chair, um, how blood pressure is regulated, how heart rate is uh, affected, uh, so that enough blood is going to your brain um, uh, and enough oxygen supply is maintained. Um, 
baroreceptors and reflexes related to that have been uh, uh, thought to be the primary uh, mechanism that regulate uh, blood pressure. Um, and again, these mechanisms have been parsed out uh, in significant detail uh, previously. Uh, but there is also data uh, that show that natural head movements, um, uh, such as sort of uh, you know pitching your head up and right, uh, sort of getting out from the bed, uh, doing head tilts uh, on either side, for example, that these contribute uh, to sympathetic activation, so muscle sympathetic tone, for example, as well as controlling postural uh, blood pressure. So, so patients who have, for example, orthostatic hypotension, right, uh, where uh, certain postural changes uh, cannot be compensated. Uh, we know that there is a component coming from the vestibular system, uh, which allows us to detect our head motion and, and maintain our sort of uh, body posture on ground uh, stable, as well as neck on, uh, on uh, uh, head on the neck stable, uh, has, a, has a significant role to play in this. And, and this has been termed the vestibular sympathetic reflex. Um, it's been uh, hypothesized uh, based on uh, previous research and previous studies, uh, majority of them coming from uh, human data, that the otolith organs, the ones that are responsible for uh, sensing gravity and linear accelerations, uh, drive this reflex and not the semicircular canals. And I'm gonna show you data from uh, Darian's uh, research that shows that that's actually not really true. Um, uh, and then we know that these responses can be modified uh, because of aging, for example, um, there's data in the, in the clinical literature coming from compromised vestibular system in patients, uh, 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 such as, for example, patients who have difficulties in maintaining, maintaining gaze, they have, they have dizziness, um, they have conditions called benign paroxysmal positional vertigo and others, uh, where uh, they, they'll show a decreased orthostatic tolerance, meaning that they'll, they'll, they won't be able to regulate, uh, for example, the sympathetic tone, uh, or maintain blood pressure as they suddenly stand up, for example. There's also a result uh, from, uh, from studies in astronauts that exposure to microgravity um, can also affect this. Now, again, these are not, in, in human subjects, uh, this is not uh, the easiest to sort of uh, parse out, uh, given that, you know, uh, baroreceptors, parasympathetic and sympathetic activations play a role altogether uh, in maintaining uh, a blood pressure and, and heart rate. Uh, so it's, it's been challenging to sort of parse out some of these things and, and we have needed uh, new techniques, new ways in which we can locally stimulate, for example, parts of the peripheral vestibular system um, and start understanding uh, what are the changes that we, that we evoke um, as we stimulate, for example, specific otolith organs or, uh, or the vestibular system. Um, uh, and, and so now you see the point of why um, I introduced infrared stimulation at the beginning. Uh, one of our collaborators, uh, Gay Holstein, uh, at uh, Mount Sinai in New York, uh, has been working uh, in sort of parsing out the anatomy of this vestibular sympathetic reflex uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, her major part of her career. Um, and she has shown uh, that through the vestibular system, we have um, a significant excitatory and inhibitory uh, pathways um, that go through CVLM into RVLM. This is a center where baroreceptor input also comes in. Uh, and these two systems tend to come together uh, to eventually uh, impart a control on blood pressure as well as heart rate. So, so we know that the baroreflex pathway, for example, is a, is a rapid um, uh, 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 sort of negative feedback pathway um, uh, that's available, whereas the, um, uh, whereas the uh, vestibular uh, pathway, that, that's uh, vestibular sympathetic pathway, is a direct feed forward mechanism uh, which plays a role during head motions in posture relative to gravity. Um, there is a significant amount of study by using, for example, galvanic vestibular stimulation. So this has been used in spinal cord uh, injury research as well uh, to sort of understand um, uh, you know, balance issues in, in uh, some of the spinal cord injury patients. Uh, but, but on the left, what you're seeing is um, uh, in a rat model, uh, uh, bilateral uh, sinusoidal galvanic stimulation. So uh, electrical stimulation that's provided over here, it's bilateral sinusoidal. Um, and then what it does is it, it 
ends up decreasing both the blood pressure as well as the heart rate uh, and modulates it sinusoidally. Now, the frequency of modulation here is roughly twice uh, the sinusoidal uh, galvanic, uh, uh, galvanic system, and, and we, can, we can talk about the mechanisms later uh, if somebody's interested. But um, suffice it to know that by activating the vestibular system, other researchers have shown that you can evoke a change in heart rate and blood pressure. Um, this is uh, in the middle is, is, a, is, a, is a cat model uh, where uh, the eighth nerve or e was either denervated or not. So you can see on the top is a denervated uh, uh, prior to denervation. And then uh, in the bottom is the, is the response. Uh, and this is essential mean aortic pressure that was measured over time um, uh, during a tilt motion. And you can see that there is a significant decrease, significant change uh, post uh, denervation of the eighth nerve. So again, sort of showing the contribution of the vestibular system in this. Um, and then in patients, human subjects, uh, a, a sympathetic tone, for example, has been shown um, as you do uh, what's known as off vertical axis rotation, where you end up stimulating part of the vestibular system. So again, we know that the vestibular system does play a direct role uh, in controlling heart rate, blood pressure, and, and sympathetic uh, nerve tone. Um, the, the same thing from uh, the electrical stimulation. Again, you can see that these are like you know, different uh, current levels uh, that Gay and, and her colleagues used uh, uh, to evoke a, a reduction in the blood pressure. And, and what she did uh, post in these, uh, these rat models is uh, in, a, in the brain, uh, in the vestibular nucleus regions, she actually looked at early activated gene called CFOS uh, at about 90 minutes post uh, stimulation of the vestibular system. And on the left bottom, you can see a control uh, brain. So no stimulation of the vestibular uh, system. And, and you can see that there's really no CFOS activated. Over here, there's very specific CFOS activated patterns, especially in this medial um, vestibular nuclei uh, that you can see over here. Uh, and then again, we know that from her studies in sort of uh, <clears throat> Uh, retrograde delabeling uh, that, that you know these these neurons then project onto uh, RVLM those that center that I talked about earlier uh, where uh, the uh, vestibular information goes uh, so so here's a little circuit from the vestibular system through the vestibular nuclei uh, projecting to CVLM and then providing an excitatory as well as an inhibitory input as well as a direct input from those vestibular nuclear neurons that I showed you to the RVLM. Uh, and then this is the center where the information from the barrel receptor also comes in and, and converges, um, and then eventually leads to a change in heart rate and blood pressure. Again, some of these mechanisms down here and how the vestibular information gets taken into, that's, a, that's, a, that's still a, a subject that we're, we're studying. Um, so we know that these responses could be, because of the vestibular uh, activation, these responses that we evoke could be excitatory, inhibitory, or, 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 or combine of a combination of excitation and inhibition, inhibition. And here I'm not talking about the infrared radiation. I'm actually talking about changes in heart rate and blood pressure. So as we stimulate the vestibular system, we actually end up evoking not only a, a reduction sometimes in blood pressure or heart rate, but in some cases we'll get an increase, uh, for example, in heart rate and blood pressure. And that's what, that's what Bill Yates and other uh, here have highlighted from uh, sort of literature review uh, in the past. So, so Darian, when she joined my lab, uh, uh, she uh, decided to take on this sort of challenging project. And, and um, we decided to see if we can use infrared radiation, uh, go in and locally stimulate one end organ of the vestibular system in a rat and, and understand what kind of a heart rate or blood pressure changes would we be evoking as a response. Um, so here's our experimental setup. Um, so we, we implant an optical fiber uh, through, uh, through the, uh, uh, to the, into the inner ear, and we direct it at, for example, the posterior semicircular canal. Most of the data I'm gonna show you, from, show you here uh, are going to be stimulation of one of the vertical semicircular canals known as the posterior canal. And what she does is she looks at uh, the magnitude and the direction of the evoked eye movement as a confirmation that she was stimulating the posterior canal and not something else. We use micro CT um, at the end uh, in, a, in a fixed uh, 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 inner ear uh, to, to know that we actually were uh, uh, stimulating the posterior canal and not one of the other uh, canals by mistake, for example. Uh, 
And then prior to the day of the experiment, uh, what she does is she places chronically uh, a pressure sensor uh, into the femoral artery. Now, this is a telemetric sensor um, um, that, uh, for example, uh, is also available uh, in uh, uh, Dr. Mark Nash's NAB. Crystal, when she was here, she was, uh, she was working to set up this system uh, where, where we can implant these, these sensors in the femoral artery uh, as well as in other, other parts. Um, in the rat, uh, it, it's an easy location to put this, uh, put this sensor in, and, and it will measure uh, through uh, a pressure transducer, um, both the mean uh, and diastolic systolic blood pressure, as well as heart rate, uh, for example. And what we do uh, to evoke uh, a response uh, similar to the sinusoidal galvanic stimulation is we'll provide a, a modulated frequency, modulated infrared uh, radiation. So we modulate this in frequency itself, um, and we stimulate the posterior canal, uh, and then we look at eye movements as well as heart rate and blood pressure. And there are different parameters of of uh, infrared stimulation that we use, different wavelengths, different different diameters, so different size of the uh, a beam that we would want to use, um, and different pulses as well as different stimulation frequencies. And what she found, lo and behold, was that once you reach a certain threshold, uh, which is indicated over here on the left, in the, this is one rat, uh, which was implanted with that sensor, um, and then the next day stimulated uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the infrared radiation of the posterior canal, is that the moment you turn on, and, and so on the top, what you see these red bars are the duration of the infrared stimulation. So this is the vestibular stimulation that we were providing. And what you saw was a drop in blood pressure this is the mean blood pressure, and the bottom is the heart rate. And, and she saw a drop in heart rate as well. And as you can appreciate in these, some of these higher uh, amplitude responses is that the responses are, are sinusoidal and they modulate roughly with the frequency of the, of the stimulation. So this is about 0.5 hertz stimulation. This is two minutes of stimulation. Uh, each period is around uh, 20 seconds, right? So you're getting uh, a, a very nice uh, a, a modulated response uh, as we stimulate with the infrared in both heart rate and blood pressure, and both of them are reducing. She could do this in, um, in around 17 rats. Uh, so, so she's just finishing up a paper uh, that's in a second round of review where, uh, where we've, we've, we've been able to show that this response is uh, very clear and consistent across 17 rats, and it doesn't fatigue. So you can do this for many hours in a rat, um, and you would continue to get the response um, uh, uh, as long as uh, the baseline parameters of the heart rate and blood pressure are stable. Um, she wanted to look at whether there was a cycle by cycle change. So as I said, like, you know, you have a two minute stimulation, there are, there are six cycles of infrared stimulation, and she wanted to see whether the initial response uh, in, in, that, that we get is, is, is significantly higher compared to, this, to the next cycles. Um, and so she looked at both the heart rate and the blood pressure. There's just some ways in which we analyze this data to look at uh, whether we see any significant changes. And there is some trend uh, where the initial uh, cycle seems to produce a, a slightly higher change in heart rate and blood pressure. But overall, um, across uh, hundreds of cycles uh, of data that were collected from 17 rats, um, and here she's showing uh, data from six rats uh, simulated at the same energy, so same stimulation uh, energy, that there's really no statistically significant difference across this. If you look at the changes themselves, they are, significant, they are pretty large. So we get uh, heart rate changes anywhere from 10 to 50 or 60 beats per minute. Um, and then the blood pressure changes range anywhere from two to three uh, millimeters of mercury to eight, 10, and in some cases, uh, 12 or 15 uh, millimeters of mercury. Uh, so we get a, a pretty high uh, range of, of, of responses across uh, both the uh, heart rate as well as the blood pressure. Um, and this is just showing across many different trials, trying to see if, if there are different uh, uh, you know, correlating factors, such as there's a, whether there's a dose response curve, whether as you increase the stimulation energy of the laser, uh, meaning you deliver a higher energy through the photons, do you get uh, sort of any kind of a dose response curve? And it doesn't seem like we get a a dose response curve, meaning that it's sort of like an all or none type of a response that we tend to get. Um, and, and in red over here, she's just highlighting like, you know, one, uh, one rat. And again, like, you know, we don't really see a trend uh, across, uh, across uh, energy. So we don't really see a dose response curve, but we can do this for many, many cycles uh, across rats. Um, 
uh, we looked at whether uh, the responses that we uh, that we get um, uh, have any correlation to uh, the cycle number, as we said, and, and really that really doesn't change anything. So, so we can do this uh, 12 times in a rat, or we can do this just one time in a rat, and the response is always uh, consistent. Um, um, and then uh, uh, she looked at, you know, uh, sort of a, a change in heart rate versus me uh, blood pressure. So was was the change in heart rate always correlated with the blood pressure? And there seems to be uh, a pretty significant sort of correlation between heart rate and blood pressure, meaning that that, that, that there's um, uh, there is a direct response from posterior canal, uh, and then both the heart rate change and the blood pressure are correlated. It's not one versus the other. We have tried to look at, for example, latency of the response, which is a little bit difficult to see, uh, given that the onset of the response is difficult to uh, sort of quantify um, in these slow responses, um, but that's something I think she's continuing to look at. Um, We've looked at you know, whether the physiological baseline uh, plays a role uh, in the observed, observed responses that we have. And as you can imagine, like, you know, uh, in addition to an aesthetic state, uh, so the drugs that we're giving, and here we're using ketamine and xylosine, for example, um, uh, the baseline uh, heart rate and blood pressure uh, is very tightly uh, regulated, for example, in, in these rats, right? So usually we know that the blood pressure is somewhere between 75 to 85 uh, millimeters of mercury in the rat, um, and then the uh, heart rate is close to around 240, 250 beats per minute. And we see majority of the infrared evoked responses uh, around this, uh, around this uh, region, uh, around these uh, parameters. So one of the other ways that we can look at, uh, sort of start to sort of go beyond uh, just qualitatively uh, looking at whether we are evoking a response, how big of a response are we evoking, is start to start to understand uh, some of the mechanisms that might be underlying, some of the pathways that might be underlying. So on the left over here, uh, what, uh, what I'm showing you um, over here is a little pathway uh, in terms of uh, heart rate. Um, and what you see is that both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system have a control over uh, a heart rate. And then eventually that has uh, control over cardiac output and blood pressure. Um, and in the, in the field of cardiovascular research, uh, this power analysis or spectrum analysis, so using fast Fourier transform to take this time domain data, convert it into a frequency domain, um, and then look at a power that is contained in specific frequency regions at low frequencies, high frequencies. Um, and there has been an attempt uh, to sort of parse out whether the uh, parasympathetic versus the sympathetic pathways were uh, more or less active, uh, for example, in, in these cases. So, um, uh, I'll, I'll show some results over here um, uh, from the heart rate variable analysis. So, so what Darian did was she went in, uh, she took the data um, two minutes prior to an optical stimulation, an infrared stimulation of the vestibular system. So these are these white bars and two minutes of the infrared radiation, which is this filled red bars over here. Uh, and this is multiple different trials at different radiant energies in a rat. And what she did is she, she did in the frequency components, uh, uh, she looked at the low frequency response, which is somewhere which, uh, which is at the uh, low frequency range. So as you see over here, that's the, free, the low frequency area is uh, somewhere between uh, 0.05 uh, to around 0.1 Hertz. Uh, between 0.1 Hertz to around 0.5 Hertz is the high frequency peak. So we take the power, the underlying area under the curve, um, and, and we plotted those over here for those components uh, during uh, or prior to the, the vestibular stimulation. Um, and what she found is that a ratio of these two frequencies, which is in the cardiovascular field taken to be uh, a measure of sympathetic activity. And, and there are, you know, I realize that there are um, uh, sort of, there's a debate about uh, whether this is the right measure or not. Um, but this is one of the measures that's available to us that we can use. Um, uh, that, that, that we use to sort of look at whether there is a sympathetic activity. And what, what she does is she, she looks at across all the rats that she has stimulated, uh, is there a, 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 a ratio, uh, low frequency to high frequency ratio to infrared radiation that ends up uh, coming out more prominent? And what you can see over here for one rat, for example, is that that ratio, low frequency to high frequency, is significantly higher during infrared stimulation of the vestibular system versus prior to the stimulation. So there's, there's an increase that we see over here, and that's consistent across multiple different stimulation trials. 
the, the real numbers over here are sort of the, abs the absolute numbers don't really uh, sort of matter. They really need to be normalized in some way. Um, but what you see is that across a number of rats, majority of the rats, almost 12 out of the 17 rats, show overall an increase in this, in this ratio, suggesting that there is a vestibulosympathetic activation uh, through the semicircular canal, so through this posterior canal pathway that we, that we simulate. Um, she then uh, actually divided that da the data a little bit further um, and looked at whether uh, we can look at uh, sympathetic versus uh, a parasympathetic responses. And the, and the ways that we can look at this is we can look at these frequency domain parameters um, during changes in heart rate and blood pressure. So those sinusoidal changes, so as, you, as you saw, both with the galvanic stimulation as well as infrared, what you get is a change in the baseline of the heart rate and blood pressure as well as a sinusoidal modulation. So you can take the peak-to-peak -peak data, and again, you know, you can look at that across uh, these low-frequency, high-frequency ratios and, and the components themselves, uh, and you can look at the percentage change in heart rate, or you can do the same thing for baseline changes. So how much during the IR stimulation did the baseline itself reflect? And, and as we know, the parasympathetic would be expected to be more dominant uh, and have a negative correlation, uh, during, uh, during baseline function, changes in baseline function. So sort of like a change in resting function, for example. And we see some little negative uh, correlation over here, whereas mostly a positive correlation with the low frequency um, in, uh, in, uh, uh, w w in the sinusoidal uh, change itself. Uh, and so we, we sort of see that, you know, it's, again, it's not as clear. It seems that there is a, a more predominantly sympathetic activation. However, uh, this, the parasympathetic activation, just because the baseline itself shifts, um, is going to be playing a role uh, in the response that we observe. Uh, you know, to be, uh, uh, to uh, sort of satisfy the reviewers as well as to kind of uh, answer the question ourselves, uh, you know, uh, whether the posterior canal really is playing a role in this evoked response where not, none of the field has actually shown um, that, the, that one of the semicircular canals might be involved, although it's been hypo like, you know, hypothesized for decades, uh, it hasn't really been shown uh, in any clinical study or, or any uh, animal studies before our study. Uh, and so we wanted to be sure that what we are observing um, is, is not some kind of an artifact because of this artificial infrared radiation that we were using. So what we did was uh, we used a, a focused bipolar stimulation uh, of the posterior canal. Uh, so, so we made a, a, we fabricated a little bipolar electrode uh, and we stimulated the posterior canal. And what we ended up seeing with the, with the electrical stimulation is a very similar response um, to what we get with the, with the infrared stimulation is this drop in heart rate and blood pressure, very similar magnitudes and, and fairly similar in terms of uh, frequency following response to that 0.5 hertz stimulation that we had. Um, and again, the ratio of the low frequency to the high frequency that we saw in these uh, three rats that we did electrical stimulation uh, was again, uh, more uh, significant uh, towards, uh, towards the stimulation. So, so we think that you know, there is a sympathetic activation. Of course, there is a parasympathetic pathway that's also getting activated during this time. The, then, you know, obvious question was, um, uh, are we you know, uh, showing something that's new? Uh, are we showing something that's, um, uh, that, you know, what would we see if we stimulated the utricle in this case? Um, so previously in all the human subject studies, as well as the sinusoidal galvanic stimulation, uh, it was a whole stimulation of the entire vestibular system. Uh, here, we're actually, for the first time, able to go in uh, and individually stimulate specific end organs. And so what Darian did was uh, she was able to uh, actually stimulate just the utricle by placing an optical fiber uh, at the utricle instead of the semicircular canal. Um, and what she found is, you know, very characteristic eye movement responses uh, that you would expect from a stimulation of the utricular nerve. But during the infrared stimulation, we saw really no change either in heart rate or the blood pressure, uh, which is very surprising to us. Um, and I'll come a little bit uh, during my conclusion slide uh, as to what this may or may not mean. Um, but this, this has been very surprising and puzzling to us um, that despite the entire field suggesting that primarily this response is driven to the utricle, um, that the semicircular canals are the ones that tend to be playing, seem to be playing a role. So 
So sort of concluding, uh, uh, given that, you know, we're almost at 1250, um, we, it's been established in the literature that the caudal vestibular nuclear complex sends uh, direct projections to these centers um, that have a regulation, regulatory role in terms of uh, blood, blood pressure control, for example, uh, during postural uh, changes that are taking place. We've shown uh, through Darian's work for the first time that activation of this physiological pathway to very uh, focused semicircular canal stimulation rather than a utricular stimulation seems to have a significant effect on uh, heart rate and blood pressure. Um, and both of them seem to uh, reduce significantly, uh, very similar to what has been observed uh, uh, both in humans as well as in, in, uh, in uh, other uh, preclinical studies. So what we hypothesize, um, and, and this is where I was coming from the previous slide, is that these central vestibular sympathetic reflex neurons uh, likely are getting convergent input. Um, and and we, know, we know this to be true, uh, that they're getting convergent input from the posterior canal as well as the utricle. But that, what we are getting is a utricular potentiation of the response. So the posterior canal during tilt, for example, or, or during a head up type of a movement as you're getting out of a chair or your bed is, is sending this input but that respo response is actually getting potentiated by utricular response bilaterally. Remember that we only stimulated in, in our preclinical model only single side. Uh, Darian is now moving towards experiments where she'll start to stimulate bilaterally. And so what we think is that the utricular stimulation actually ends up potentiating this posterior canal uh, induced change. Um, as well as what we likely are, are seeing is uh, a utricular and posterior canal uh, neurons uh, targeting different chemoanatomic cellular populations. So this is a study that's ongoing with uh, Dr. Holstein uh, at Mount Sinai that I mentioned where she uses, uh, uh, sort of, uh, she's, she's, under, she's trying to understand which are the neurons uh, in the central system that are GABAergic versus glutamatergic, um, and what are their pathways uh, from the periphery? So, so we've been sort of uh, working with her on uh, on some of these brain samples um, that we have collected after uh, with peripheral vestibular stimulation, um, and using anatomical methods to to understand um, what the pathways might be and what the chemoanatomy of these neurons might be. Now, how does that all uh, relate to spinal cord injury? Um, and again, I think there is a talk tomorrow morning, uh, Dr. Nash is giving at the Grand Rounds, um, uh, where we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about it. And I'm, I'm excited to see that. Um, but, but we know that there is a significant cardiovascular sequelae of spinal cord injury. So, so literature has shown that orthostatic hypotension, impaired regulation of blood pressure, blood volume uh, in a chronic, as well as in some, some cases, subacute phases in spinal cord injury, uh, especially uh, sort of high cervical and thoracic injuries um, uh, is very uh, common across patients. Um, and, and there are multiple ways that people are trying to sort of understand what these pathways are, what these mechanisms are, and how uh, we might be able to uh, help the patients. Um, but depending upon the stimulation modality um, and the stimulation parameters that are used, there is some literature that shows that vestibular system actually might have a pathway um, where cerebrovascular tone during sort of simulated posture stresses uh, can be uh, evoked. Um, and that can actually lead to contraction or constriction or dilation uh, and hence regulate blood flow. Uh, there are some patients using, so there are some uh, clinical studies using uh, sinusoidal galvanic stimulation in SCI patients, although I haven't really seen a direct study uh, sort of linking uh, a, a peripheral vestibular deficit um, or uh, through the uh, vestibular spinal projections, for example, uh, uh, this response being impaired. Um, so that's a, that's a potential area of research uh, that, that might be uh, potentially studied, right? So, and, and again, we also know that, that descending signals uh, modify these vestibulospinal reflexes, um, as well as these vestibulosympathetic reflexes. So there is potential to uh, uh, sort of like you know, for, for studies at Miami Project uh, to sort of study some of this. Um, and uh, we, would, uh, we would be uh, more than happy to collaborate uh, and work with anybody uh, if interested. Um, so with that, uh, given that my time is up, I'll, I'll stop. I'll just thank everybody in my lab. Um, so you see over here, um, the one wearing the glasses is, is uh, Darian Rice. Uh, she's the one who's been leading this project, um, uh, and she's a, 
uh, fourth year biomedical engineering PhD student. Um, uh, and, and this is the rest of my lab, who many of you have met uh, since our Move to Miami project. Um, and then of course, uh, my collaborators across uh, uh, different universities, um, as well as at University of Miami, John, who's been working uh, with us in sort of understanding some of the mechanisms um, uh, of, uh, uh, of infrared stimulation. Um, and, and then finally, uh, funding through uh, uh, NIH, uh, NIDCD, uh, as well as a subcontract that we have through uh, the Mount Sinai R01 uh, uh, to study some of these uh, responses uh, that I wanted to mention. Um, and with that, um, I'll be uh, happy to take uh, any questions uh, that you might have.